Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode. I'm your host as always, Dina, and today we're going to talk about caregiving and some of the strains that come into it. We don't always talk about it. It's not something that we hear about, but it's something that should be near and dear to a lot of our hearts because whether you're taking care of your grandparent or your parents is something that we all should relate to. Here to somehow talk about and help us assist in a little bit more understanding as to the strains in caregiving and a little bit more into how it's so important. Uh, Today we're joined by Kylie Mayer. How are you going today, Kylie? Very good, very happy to be here, Dana. Thanks for having me here. Of course, always welcome. You're always welcome to come here. Um, So would you like to talk a little bit more about yourself and sort of how you got into, into caregiving and into the topic as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a gerontologist, which means I study aging and I get to study aging in a lot of different ways. So a little bit of uh, public policy, psychology, sociology, uh, bioepidemiology, although I'm a little bit, you know, rusty there in some, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I came into this field actually because I was very fortunate to have family members when I was growing up who lived to be into late old age. So I got to know my great, great aunt and my great grandmother. And I remember going to the nursing home with them and visiting them with my father. And um, eventually I did the high school volunteer hours that a lot of students in the US are are required to do. So I thought, you know what, I'm familiar with nursing home settings and I decided I I would volunteer there. And I realized that the long-term care system in the United States it wasn't what I hoped it could be, that there were a lot of things that could be improved in terms of quality. And over time, as I studied aging a little bit more in an academic sense through undergraduate graduate school, I realized one of the things that we need to be doing better as a society is, you know, of course, we, we can always be improving our formal care services, but families are going to be so key to taking care of older adults who are living with chronic and disabling conditions in our aging society. So I kind of put my hope and my research interest in in better supporting family caregivers. Well, that sounds that sounds incredible. And you've even gone further than a lot of it and gone to become an assistant professor. That is that is amazing to share your wisdom in such a it's such a helpful and you know um, enjoyable way as well. I am very, very lucky. This was one of those cases where um, I was able to pursue what I loved and um, found a way to make it work as a career. Although I I will say there was a brief stint when I thought I was going to be an elder law attorney. So all of this to say that there are many, many people working in the field of aging um, from a research standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from an advocacy standpoint, um, to better support long-term supports and services and better support family members or caring for somebody who's living with chronic and disabling conditions. So I'm just fortunate to help in this one specific way as a researcher. Uh, that sounds it sounds incredible to me. And I mean, amazingly, that sounds that's perfect for our show here today. Um, before we get started on the topic, we like to have a little icebreaker and sort of talk about, get to know you a little bit more. Um, so when I have these few different topics, just share the first thing that sort of comes to your head and what you can think of. Sounds good. Okay, so the first one is book. So on my nightstand right now, and it's a little bit heavy, so it's been taking me a while, it's um, The Problem of Alzheimer's Disease by Jason Carlawash. And it's just a really good book if you get a chance to look at it. It's uh, one of those where it ties together the policy side, the personal side, the science side to really help understand the state of, a science, of the science in Alzheimer's disease, including caregiving. 
um, in, in how, where we are in terms of our policies and clinical treatments and supports is in some ways, you know, the culmination of a lot of intentional effort and in some ways chance in many ways. And I just found, find it really enlightening and um, just fascinating. Now that sounds, that sounds really nice too. It doesn't sound like a light read. I'll put it put it like that. I have my other books next to it. My light nice fiction too. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, how about movie? Yes, my absolute favorite film uh, since I was like ten or eleven when it came out is Big Fish, and it's this just fantastic story. Are you familiar with it? Yes, yes, I loved watching it. Hundred percent. It was probably the most. I don't know for. It, it really hit deeply and it just it made you think about life as a whole and everything everything you thought you knew I'm just like wow okay this is something that I really need to pay attention to as well well and it's something where you know in some ways it probably is very pertinent to some of the things you talk about on the podcast where that father-son relationship where the son's going tell me the truth dad and the dad has always told his life history through these fantastical stories. And over time you realize, well, it wasn't really the truth that mattered. And I just, um, oh God, if you need a good cry, that one always gets me. <laughs> no, it, it gets me, especially how, like, just how much it hits is how much it's oh. like, I looked at my dad the next day and I'm like, can you tell me, can, are there some things that you want to share with me? I'm like, just, just teach me more about the world that you see. Cause it's like, it's so different. Oh yeah. How about podcast? So this is, I have to make a plug for, um, me, my, uh, where I did my PhD, the Leonard Davis school of gerontology at the, uh, excuse me, the university of Southern California, way too many names, pardon <laughs> me. Um, but they do a, a podcast called lessons in lifespan health. And if you ever want to put on your gerontology nerd hat, which I like to do, um, they just have all of the different professors that they work with at USC talking about different aspects of aging. Some's focused on caregiving. Other things are focused on aging policy and how older adults were managing through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of it, I, it goes like way over my head, like when the biologists speak, but it's it's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. No, that does sound, that does sound interesting. It sounds very um I mean, I like to get, especially when it comes to this podcast, I find myself digging deep into things that I never thought and getting down this hole and listening to things that I never thought I would have an interest in, but learning about it. And I think like I've, it got damaged by the idea of school as well, where you're forced to learn it. So now learning right. it out of an interest is so different because now you're finding it so much more enjoyable. And I just love, like, I'm definitely going to listen to the podcast because I just love listening to things that just make you think about the world a little bit more. So that's definitely on my, I'm going to add that to my list now for sure. Please do. Yeah. How about famous role model? So of course, this is just like asking a favorite book. So, you know, you can't choose because you're going, okay, I admire all these people in different ways. Um, so I will first say I am no expert on him, but, and I hadn't actually thought about this person before last year, but I stumbled upon, um, there's this series of audiobooks through Audible called Music Plus, what was it? Music and something, I'm going to forget the name. Oh, wow, Words Plus Music. And it was on the uh, composer Yo-Yo Ma. And oh my gosh, I just found out that I admired the heck out of this person. He's just such a um, down to earth person. And I really admired learning about his relationship with music and his uh, approach to creation and collaboration with others to create good in the world. So I, I, and there's something about having, you know, the story plus the music. So I think he's somebody I've, I've come to admire quite a bit. It's amazing when you can find a connection between the two, like there's a there's a whole idea. I mean, because I'm um, I've studied film and I'm still studying it at the moment. So we just learned about audio and how it connects to a storyline and how everything is so different. If you like mute it and just watch something, it's so different. You don't feel the effect until you turn the audio on. So it's amazing how much it affects a storyline. So I can definitely see how he would be such a huge, it's huge. Um, role model as well 
Well, and it's funny because even thinking about like uh, we were just talking about the movie Big Fish, that Danny Elfman soundtrack in the background, it just oh pulls at your heartstrings. Yes, no, 100%. It, it hits you in a different way because just because the audio tells you this is what you need to feel right now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, how about course that you've completed? Yeah, so um, as you can tell with you know, my interdisciplinary training in gerontology, I am a huge supporter of the liberal arts. And I had this amazing opportunity when I was an undergraduate student. Um, I, I don't know how this happened. This is one of the great things about having like a small liberal arts school when you, you have that experience, um, where a professor let me do this independent study that helped catch my interest in an academic sense in aging where you know I did some um, a service piece to it. So I did some companionship and visiting to some um, persons who were living with dementia. And I was reading philosophy at the same time. And I was trying to pull together this kind of what I was seeing happening with what these, you know, big philosopher names were saying about, you know, existence and all of that. And it, it was helping me really grapple with um, what is person-centered care what do we owe to each other as human beings? So there's kind of like the practical idea and these big ideas coming together. That was probably one of the coolest experiences that I've, that I've had. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. It's, it's amazing when you can sort of find, I think especially finding a professor that sort of lets you, helps you find a way to improve it or helps you find a way to see things differently and just something that helps you in a lot of ways. I think it's, it's really special when you find that one professor that, that just really wants you to find out a little bit more. Well, and, and speaking of role models, he might not be a famous role model, but, you know, he's somebody now as a faculty member myself. I go, OK, if I can give one student that kind of experience, and let them really explore their interest. It's going to be so important to, you know, them carving out their field. So I think it gives me something to aspire to having had that experience. See, that's incredible. That's I love I love the the end result of how you see professors or how you see lectures because it's so different to what you see at the beginning and then as you get older you're just like okay that act, that teacher actually really did help me and want me to succeed so it's amazing and you could definitely do that for some I'm, I'm pretty sure you have the um you have the I think you have the heart to be able to do that so that's it's going to be incredible if you do that Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, I hope I have the opportunity. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk and go dive straight into the topic. And we've invited you here to talk about caregiving through your professional opinion. And I think we talked about this off camera, but you're basically, you're going to be learning and talking about through your lens of aging and what you understand. So yeah, just that's, we want to make that clear that that's, that's that area so it's very particular um so how would you define family caregivers yeah and, and this is one of those things where in some ways it's easier to describe what caregivers do than give a precise definition so you know the proper definition and i'm pulling from you know the aarp folks is a caregiver is somebody who assists somebody who's living with a chronic illness or disability well, what the heck does that mean? It can mean a lot of things. So we have some caregivers who are providing care from a distance. So they might be providing care by looking up information about community resources or talking to a physician and getting information about a medical situation or making appointments. And then we have caregivers who are picking up groceries or helping with transportation needs. And then, you know, more and more we're seeing caregivers who are in taking on these medical tasks. So things like nursing tasks, using a gate belt, helping somebody with uh, managing their medications, giving injections, these really intensive forms of care that a, probably a lot of family members would never have imagined helping their mother with or their spouse with. And it can be quite stressful uh, for those caregivers. So those are just some of the examples. It just couldn't look so different. It can be close in proximity. It can be far in proximity. It can be in the same house or it could be in a nursing home setting as well. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the roles and so the roles that some of the caregivers play because it's not going to be a typical relationship I think as I understand it right and that's um it's interesting the and caregivers will think about this differently I have my own kind of opinions about 
you know, how somebody should think about caregiving, although this is not to say that it has to be this way. Things are going to work differently for different people. But um, we do hear a lot of caregivers who struggle with this, this transition where they're going, okay, um, I am the spouse, I'm the daughter, I'm the sibling. And suddenly you're also the caregiver. So caregiving becomes this added, added thing. And it can take some time to reconcile what that means, especially when you're caring for somebody who might having be having some changes in their cognition. And suddenly you're taking on responsibilities that are not traditional. Suddenly you're making decisions for a parent as opposed to the, the parent making decisions for you. And so it, it can um, cause some caregivers to say, oh, I feel like I'm the parent now. And sometimes that can be helpful when you're trying to frame your situation or describe it to others. But other times it can be a little bit challenging since it can kind of rub the, the other care partner the wrong way because it's going, well, no, I'm still your parent, but actually we might have a different relationship, but I'm still your parent, always have been, but different families handle that differently. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a huge kind of thing of respect as well. Like sometimes it, parents kind of expect respect in a normal traditional household. There's that, there's that need to, okay, I'm right, you're wrong kind of thing. Whereas when you get older and you become the caregiver to your parent, it kind of like, well, the respect is kind of like, it's balanced now because you're both doing the same kind of job you both have the same kind of relationship so it's I think it's like finding that balance and finding that definition of the relationship is really difficult and I think um from personal experience I think that's what I found as well taking care of my grandfather through the final final years as well that was very um the relationship definitely changed right and I, I think respect the right word because that is at the core of, of healthy caregiving relationships, if, if there is such a thing. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say that, you know, there's there's good or bad ways to provide care necessarily, but um, I think it'd be helpful to always be thinking about respect. Something we do see is gen different generations do things differently, for example. And so you might have a caregiver who, or excuse me, a care recipient who's from an older generation who's saying things like, you know, oh, when, when you're preparing meals for me, you have to heat it up on the stove instead of using the microwave. Or, you know, I, I prefer to go to the physical appointment instead of doing telemedicine. And for the caregiver who's just going, I am so overwhelmed. I just need to heat up your food. Um, you know, it, it can come across as disrespectful, but it's, it is managing and you know, how do we accomplish these tasks in a way that's satisfactory to us both, that's not overwhelming to the caregiver and still respecting uh, the care recipient's wishes. And it's, it is, in some ways, a minefield to to navigate. Yes, no, I, I can definitely agree with that. Um, looking into it, what are some of the kind of responsibilities of a caregiver towards their um, patient or towards their family member? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so on the one hand, there's kind of the tasks, the tasks that needs to get done. Done. It could be uh, household chores. It could be help with personal care. Um, so there's, you know, the getting stuff done piece of it. But then you also have the kind of manager piece of everything. So you might be coordinating doctor's appointments. You might be coordinating um, other family members or formal sources of care who are coming into the household, um, especially in medical settings, caregivers are oftentimes the advocates. So they're the person going, wait, 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 this really isn't what my loved one wishes um, and making sure that the wishes of their loved one is are, are being respected. Um, the other thing that caregivers will often find challenging, another piece of this role is decision maker. And again, I do a lot of research on caregivers to people living with dementia. And so um, you would have more of a tendency where that caregiver is going to be helping with certain decisions or doing more of that advocacy. That might not be the case quite so much with somebody who is receiving care because of a physical impairment, although there are different times in our life where uh, our co cognitive uh, capacity changes and fluctuates. So again, it, it it, it changes over time and it could change day to day for the caregiver. No, I, I'm a hundred percent. I definitely do see that. I definitely do see that happening. Um, when going to the relationship a little bit more between the caregiver, um, 
How do you see the finances sort of becoming such a huge problem? Because there's one more person dependent on, say, either a family member or even um, a whole family as a whole. Yeah, this is something, and I'm so glad you're asking about this because I think for a long time, and I'd like to hope it's changing, we've thought about caregiving as really the active um, active care, the tasks that need to get done. And I think caregivers are in many ways reluctant to talk about the financial piece and the amount of stress that can have on them um, because you know you don't want to be quote unquote complaining about how expensive caregiving can be when you know you want to be providing the best possible care to your loved one. You know sometimes I think we feel guilty about saying, "Oh, this is stressing me out financially." When you know that's a really important thing to remember with caregiving. And unfortunately, our particularly in the U.S., the context I can speak mostly of, although there's a lot of um, it resonates in other parts of the world. I think too. Um, it's a very expensive role, and we don't like to think about it, but caregiving um, can require family members to end their employment early, to lower their number of hours in employment. Um, over time, this can cost family members in the U.S., it would be ten or hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, so large chunks of their retirement um, based on lost opportunity costs. And it's also expensive. So when you're caring for somebody, um, you oftentimes are paying for things like home modifications, picking up the groceries, covering the cost of medications. All of these things add up over time. And there was a study a few years ago showing that family members are spending about $10,000 per year when caring for somebody living with dementia or $7,000 per year for somebody who's not living with dementia. And not many people have that kind of money to, to spare. And so it's something when we've talked to caregivers about their experiences of managing the finances, they just say, you know, it keeps me up at night. This is stressful, yeah. um, but it's hard to admit. Yeah, no, I think especially when it comes to it being your parent and you have that huge connection being like, I'm supposed to take care of my parent. I can't afford to take care of them, but I'm supposed to take care of them. So you take on kind of any loan or credit card debt goes higher up and all of that just like because it's that mindset it's family you're meant to take care of family and I I mean I love the mindset of taking care of family and I I think it's it definitely plays a huge toll on emotional mental and physical well-being not only for the caregiver but I think for the um, parent as well because they will know they, if they don't have, if they don't, if they can remember the situations, they will definitely know that there's a huge dependency on like how much it's going to weigh on the caregiver for sure. What are, what are some of the other alternatives to like, we were talking about retirement home versus living with them. Is there a huge kind of financial difference in that? Right. And that's going to, again, be very driven by the policy context. And so I can describe in the U.S. Um, most, most specifically where, um, you know, when you're caring for somebody who's living in the same home as you, you tend to pick up more of these everyday costs. Um, in the U.S., we have a program called Medicaid, which has really kind of become our de facto long-term supports and services program or long-term care insurance, where what happens is um, you, in order to be eligible for Medicaid services and receive things like in-home care um, and supports in the community, you have to spend down your assets to the point where you're at a poverty level and have very few assets available. And that's the only time when Medicaid would, would kick in. And so um, a lot of families feel like this is very unfair. Why should I have to spend everything I have in order to receive any kind of support from the government? Um, and so a lot of caregivers, I think, or family members try to avoid that and will use some of their own assets. And that can be um, really detrimental since we know, it, it, you know, the caregiver has to look out for their own financial well-being and retirement security. Um, and, and it's just this huge injustice. I could go on about it. Um, and then, but then comparing that to a nursing home care, um, oftentimes people will enter 
care in the United States into a nursing home with private assets or on Medicaid already. Often those people, because of nursing home care, can you know cost between eighty to one hundred thousand dollars per year or more. Um, that can very quickly eat up a person's savings, and in, in which case they would become um, you know supported by Medicaid to be in those facilities. Now there are this this whole spectrum of different care settings in between living in the community and in, in a in a home um, versus a nursing home. So you have these independent living, assistant living, although those aren't supported by any government insurance options. And so it's just very, I think that's the bottom line. It's just very, very expensive until you reach the poverty line where government support were kicking in the US. I'm sorry, you hit one of my passion points. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm completely with you there. I In Australia as well, it's really, I mean, the cost of medicine alone, the cost of, I, I remember having um, a nurse that visited once every day or a couple times a day it was expensive just to keep her around because you just had to but it was something that we had to do because none of us could be home all the time to be able to take care of them so it was just something that we knew that we needed to do and they don't tell you as you get older how much it's going to cost and even you're not working you don't have a job and the government will give you the bare minimum of what they can do to help because they're so focused on other aspects that they're not looking at it. Trust me, you hit one of my passion points as well. I think <laughs> the way that the systems are run are totally are totally mixed up as to what they're supposed to be. And yeah, I, I will put it there because I don't want to get taken down by the government right now. So um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that won't happen. I'm sure you're still. But I do want to raise to, you know, at this point, I think it's, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are um, for the, for the, you know, other 99%, there might be 1% of people that it's, you know, they can manage these costs of long-term care and what, what caregiving can bring and aging can bring in terms of cost. Um, but pe- there are differences um, between people in terms of, um, you know, from a health disparity standpoint. You know, that uh, report I was mentioning where they said it cost about $10,000 per year to cover the out-of-pocket cost of caregiving. Another point that they made, and I'm so glad they did these analyses, um, is that they looked at differences in the proportion of -of out-of-pocket costs proportionate to the household income. And if you split it up by race and ethnicity, there were some pretty big differences. So if you look at caregivers, any caregiver of any race or ethnicity in the United States, they were spending about a quarter of their household income on the out-of-pocket cost of care. Yeah. But then if you look at Hispanic family caregivers, Hispanic and Latino family caregivers, um, they were spending about 47%. So about half of their household income per year on the out-of-pocket cost of care. And it is just this huge injustice. Um, when, especially when you're providing care to a loved one, you're doing something that is, you know, so good and so important that it's it's affecting you financially. Yeah, I think I think we lose sight of that. Like you're doing a, you're helping out family, and that ends up being something that less people, less and less people are wanting to do because it becomes too costly, and it just less people are wanting to actually take care of their loved ones because they can't afford it, and that's the last thing that you want to do, especially if you're really close knit family, you want your family around or you want to be able to take care of them, but to be able to afford it, you have to work all the time, but also be there at the same time. So right. having that balance, I mean, I mean, we're going to fit perfectly into the next question. Um, how badly could caregiving affect your caregiver's mental health? Absolutely. And I want to start by saying, again, there is no such thing as the average caregiver, right? Every circumstance is going to be a bit different. But we do see some pretty substantial evidence that caregiving can affect a person's uh, mental health in a negative way. And this is particularly true for caregivers who are providing very intense forms of care, like caring for somebody who's living with dementia, So in the U.S. on average, about 7% of the population is living with uh, depression. If you look at family caregivers to people living with dementia, that goes up to 20%, 30%, depending on papers that you're looking at. So a very big difference. 
But I don't want to, you know, have any caregivers out there who are listening going, oh my gosh, I'm at this huge risk. What am I going to do? Um, Because again, there's that variation. So what we tend to see, and this is this is like most stressors that we have in our life, where it, it kind of ebbs and flows. So you're encountered with this major life stressor, a new diagnosis, a change in the care recipient's needs, and then you adapt. You might not have the scoping skills right away when this, this occurs to you, but over time you change your routines. You might learn some new skills that will help you to manage this situation. And those could be... Um, you think about kind of the Lazarus and Folkman, um, different forms of coping. They can be the problem focused coping, things like I know where to find information if I'm unsure of what to do or where to find resources, but also emotional folk or emotion focused coping that can be really important when you're caregiving, when you just know, you know, there are going to be certain constraints and things that you can't control about caregiving. And so being able to let go and say, you know, I'm going to, um, meditate or going to try to think about this in a new way. So not trying to mitigate the very real stresses that caregivers are having, but caregivers over time we find do start to build up this mental resilience and coping skills um, to help manage the stress better until the ne- next stressor comes along and you have to develop new ones, right? Yes. Every situation has a new um, stressor response that needs to be developed for sure. Uh, I think, you know, especially when it comes to the mental health how what other like ways do you think like how does it cause the for example the physical strain I mean we know that there's a huge you're relying on it emotionally but how does it affect them physically right right and that's an area that's a whole can of worms and uh, this is one of those areas i warned you before our talk i would i would add a lot of it depends and qualifiers yeah. this is an area that, that calls for probably a lot of qualifiers because the science is very quickly changing um there was a lot of research in the early 2000 um, thousands um, that were starting to show examples of caregivers showing uh, more signs of inflammation and related to to stress, and it, you know, it was very interesting research. And over time, and that's not to say that was bad science. Um, it's to say now we know more. Now we have new methods, and there's been some very recent uh, research being done. It's the care, care transition studies by David Rubin, I believe, and um, where they're looking in a more sophisticated way at these inflammation markers, so kind of these immune responses that we see in caregivers, and they're finding that the impact is not as um, direct as we thought. There's some nuances to it. So the the physical effects of caregiving in terms of an inflammatory response seem to be a bit more complicated than what we thought. Although we do know um, through another pathway, health behaviors, caregivers do tend to have um, sometimes not very good health behaviors that contribute to poor physical health. And these can be things like reaching for more sugary beverages, um, not getting a good night's sleep. And that could be because of disrupted sleep because of the care recipient or anxiety a caregiver is experiencing that mind-body connection, but also uh, skipping medical appointments. You're so busy making appointments for your loved one that you're forgetting to make your own, own preventative appointments. Yeah, no, I think that's a big, that is a big win where you're so focused on the caregiving part that you're supposed to, you forget that you have yourself to look after as well and balancing that, especially if you're having a whole family that's also relying on you as well. You suddenly take care of all the responsibility on your shoulders of taking care of a care, being a caregiver, but also being a parent to children and also taking care of yourself. I think that is a it's a huge emotional and physical and psychological strain as well. I definitely would see it. Um, so in the challenges, another more about the challenges in caregiving, what makes caregiving so hard to do in daily life that it negatively affects the caregivers? Right. And again, it's all going to be context driven. Um, There are kind of discrete tasks that I can think of that are particularly challenging for caregivers. One of those things is uh, managing incontinence. We tend to find, you know, incontinence and, you know, being able to use the restroom independently is something that we associate with a person's independence when they're, you know, at younger developmental stages. 
And so I think that psychologically, when somebody is no longer able to manage their bowels and bladder independently, that can be, that can also affect the relationship. Suddenly, that's a kind of a big care task. It's a very stressful care task uh, for family members to manage. So we do tend to see that when somebody needs more assistance with incontinence, um, that can you know, often be the trigger that that encourages a caregiver to look at more formal sources of care, be it a nursing home or a home care assistant to come in. Um, also, thinking about behavioral symptoms that are common with uh, dementia caregiving. So these are these behaviors that caregivers oftentimes um, find very irritating or don't really understand. And they might be asking the same question over and over again, um, calling out, wandering, and um, they're, they're very distressing, and it takes caregivers, I think, uh, some time to realize why these behaviors are occurring. So is it because your loved one is uncomfortable? Is there a physical discomfort? Are they emotionally uncomfort uncomfortable? Do they feel disrespected? And that can trigger these behavioral symptoms that are really, again, distressing to family caregivers. We do see an association with, um, with poor mental health outcomes in caregivers who have difficulty managing these behavioral symptoms. Um, I also want to recognize the uh, decision burden that caregivers face. So especially when you're not sure about, um, you know, decisions that your loved one might wish for in terms of their healthcare decisions, their financial decisions, if you're, if you're, um, you're holding the power of attorney for medicine or, or uh, finances, the caregivers will often feel some level of distress by going, oh my gosh, I don't feel prepared to make all of these decisions and fulfill my, my, uh, my care recipient's wishes here. Yeah, no, I I think going back to the relationship at the early time, but the daily task, I think that's a huge, as a huge thing in itself. I mean, you kind of see, you're forced for your caregiver to see you differently, I think. And like the whole relationship just sort of changes in a way that, especially if you're a parent who your child is basically the one who's helping you do simple daily tasks like going to the bathroom, taking a shower. It's it's so it must be so difficult for their on their end to be able to say, okay, my child is doing that with for me because I can't do it myself. Like the relationship and the emotional attachment to each other must be so strenuous just doing those simple daily tasks. Well, and there's this whole extra gender component too, where um, sometimes you'll have an adult uh, son because that's who available caring for his mother. And so, you know, there are certain tasks where there is typically in in many cultures a divide between, um, you know, what that interaction should look like. Should the son be providing bathing assistance or toileting assistance? And sometimes there's not much choice when, you know, it's hard to afford. Again, the finances come in here outside help to assist with that. Uh, Or maybe it's that um, the daughter in that case feels like they have to provide that level of care because there's nobody else who who would be acceptable to do so. Um, There's also the experience. So I I think a lot about the caregiver's experience, but also the care recipient's experience is important to think about. Um, There is some really interesting literature. I think Deborah Carr had had a study that started to look at this, and there's a few others that actually receiving care um, seems to be distressing um, to male care recipients. So men who are receiving care sometimes are like, no, 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 I, I don't want that level of help or support in terms of, and it, it's probably specific to the care task, mm-hmm. but um, it can be stressful to receive care too in some ways. You yeah, know, especially when you're, I think when you're an independent, when you see yourself as an independent person your whole life, and then suddenly all of that changes especially when they talk about the male figure of the house like they've always seen you as being an independent person as someone who provides and now it's suddenly the situations are different and you're left being the dependent one and that must be so um frustrating for them as well to be able to not um have have any way of controlling whether they go to the bathroom like there's no control over their bladder and things like that and that must be so frustrating for them because it's like, well, now I can't clean this up. I can't tidy up. There's people are doing that for me. So that whole emotional strain to it. Well, and I think that's that's one of the reasons why I find um, the study of aging so interesting from a social perspective where 
you know, I think um, in many Western societies in particular, there's this tendency to see yourself as this independent being, as you say, and it's almost like, um, and, and this is an overstatement. I know everybody, there's, there's different circumstances, but we treat um, individuals as if they're going to live from, you know, they're existing as a 25 year old to a 60 year old, they're going to be completely independent, not have any cognitive or functional impairment. And yet in reality, our, our level of functioning and ability to be independent changes over time and fluctuates. I mean, you might be have a surgery or you might be experiencing a mental challenge or something else could be happening in your life that could compromise your ability at any point. It, it could be, you know, when you're late in older, older age, although we, we, we tend to see that more often because of these chronic conditions associated with aging, but it could happen anywhere in the lifespan where you're not independent. You really are interdependent with your family mm -hmm. and we all are going to need help at one point. So I guess if I could, could make any kind of recommendation is begin to accept that um, we are interdependent beings and we'll need to rely on each other um, for different points in our life where we might be more vulnerable than we, we'd like to think. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a big, interdependent, such a different, that's such a nice word to to see it as because you're just you're like I've never really heard that word before but as soon as you say it I'm like that seems to fit the situation really well in terms of how how we relate to each other and how everything just sort of fits perfectly into each other and just so reliant on each other's help to do anything really so going in right oh yeah Oh, cool, please go ahead. Okay, please. so going into some of the common mistakes and misconceptions that occur, what are some of the common misconceptions about caregiving that you've you've found? Right. Um, oh gosh. So I think one of the things that caregivers will often have to come to terms with, and it's it's tough to come to terms with this, is okay when you're when you're caring for somebody who's living with a chronic conditions. I think caregivers might encounter a point where they have to come in, provide care because of maybe with older adults, it could be a fall, it could be a health event, it could be a new diagnosis. And they think uh, it's this discrete thing, like, okay, I'm going to provide care for a little bit and it's going to be done. And over time, they realize, wait a minute, there's going to be times where I'm very needed. There's going to be times where the, the person that I'm caring for can be a little more independent. And there is this... Um, you know, it can be hard to say how long caregiving for somebody with a chronic condition such as dementia, how long it will last. So caregivers might not understand that right away. Um, the other thing that I think, and this comes from kind of a, a social service and a professional standpoint, um, this misconception that we see is about kind of these assumptions that we make about families. And again, I'll go back to culture where I think um, there are these sometimes very simplified understandings of uh, different cultural values and, and characteristics. So for example, in the United States, um, I do I, I worked previously in Southern California and then South Texas. So this is why I talk a lot about Latino and Hispanic family caregivers. Those were the, the caregivers that I was encountering most. Um, we talk about the concept of familialism, this idea that um, the family is is highly valued and we take care of each other. And so I think somehow for some service professionals have had the unfortunate misconception saying, oh, these particular fam family caregivers in this particular cultural, they take care of their own. We don't need to worry about them. They don't need services because they take care of each other. Well, that's absolutely not the case. That's yeah. a huge misconception. And so I think from a professional standpoint, making sure that we don't make those assumptions and actually provide good assessments to, to any caregiver no matter their background, to make sure we understand their individual needs and family context. How common? How common is that kind of situation in the U.S.? Com Wait, let me try to understand the question. How, I, I mean, that's with the sort of expectation of the Hispanic compared to the uh, Caucasian sort of interaction, the amount of caregiving. How common is it? for the assumption for it to be, okay, they take care of their own. You don't need to help them as much. Yeah, I think I can, it's hard to say with frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So 
you know, I, I don't have a, a survey that says, oh, service providers believe X, Y, or Z. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we did, a, actually, we, I guess we, we did. It's just been a while since I looked at the day. There was a survey we did of service providers to family caregivers in California. And I know we were starting to see some results there. And this was not published in a peer-reviewed journal, but we had it in like a report that we did for um, the California Task Force on Family Caregiving, where there seemed to be maybe not outright assumptions where people were saying, oh, we, we aren't worried about this population. Um, but you could see there weren't specific services. I think that's where it comes in. It's the absence of services that are tailored to caregivers from different cultures. So are we providing culturally tailored education that takes into account the different family structures that we have? Are we providing this these education services to family caregivers in languages that they, they speak or feel most comfortable speaking? Do we have um, information on, and uh, in, information and referral professionals who can provide um, services in, in Spanish in particular in the United States? Although, of course, we, we have a huge population of many diff different caregivers who we need to um, reach with different languages too. That's very interesting. Like just looking at this, thinking about the data, thinking about the um, the different ways that caregivers are viewed between nationalities as well, like the different cultures that sort of take place in terms of caregiving. Because there's a little bit of a, I think when it comes to like with my family as well, we had a huge debate as to whether we put them in a nursing home or as if that's a question whether, because my, um, I'm half Caucasian and half Malaysian. So the culture is two very different things. So my parents were having a pretty much a discussion as to my father was like, we can't take care of him. So it's better we send them to a home. Whereas my mother is like, oh, it's family. You're meant to take care of family. You're not meant to like put them somewhere else. You're meant to take them and provide for them. So the whole understanding of what caregiving looks like um, amongst different nationalities is such an interesting way of like study as well. Well, and I think that's just such a great example because I think a lot of families have this experience where you have this idea of what care should look like and that's an important part of your family values and you know, a lot of family family members will say, I promised mom or dad that I would never send them to a care home. And I think there are circumstances where it, it can be helpful for family caregivers to kind of say, you know, I, I made that promise, but I never knew how challenging it would be or what these needs would look like and provide that forgiveness and say, okay, I, I think in this case, it might be okay understanding these circumstances. I wasn't aware of this before. On the other hand, and I'm going to go back to that policy system and that policy context, why can't we provide services and supports to family caregivers and older adults who need that kind of care in their communities in the way that they want it? I think that's that's um, a huge question. Why are our policies responsive to the different family values that we see across cultures and across individuals? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a huge question that we should take further up because I don't think... I'm pretty sure they don't even know the answer to it, to be honest. And it's such a um, it's such a complex situation as well because there's so many ways in which it can be helped, but we have no idea, no way of actually finding out how what isn't what is required in order to help. So it's a very interesting sort of dynamic that the policies are made to look at to be. Um. So is it? true that caregiving does cause conflict amongst family members? This is another one of those, it depends. <laughs> um, and I think there are certainly situations about caregiving that can contribute to, to conflict, although not necessarily. Um, some of those things are different beliefs among family members about what care should look like. I think mom needs this. I think dad needs this. Um, and that can be a source of conflict. Um, there might be some caregivers who have different expectations of support from other family members. 
saying, you know, we, we hear oftentimes uh, those caregivers who are saying, hey, I'm on my own here. I really thought that my brother or my sibling or, or others would be stepping up to help with this situation, but I keep asking and they're not coming through the way that they wish they would. Or, um, you know, maybe they are coming through, but when they come, come their support that they offer that, that caregiver might not be what's welcome. Uh, I, I oftentimes joke about the kind of parachute family members who come in for like that week here or there to provide respite or support or to visit their their family members. And uh, suddenly they're they're the experts on the situation. They say, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. And you can imagine if you're a primary care going, wait a minute, you don't know the context here. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely, I think, I think I've seen a lot of, I think there are a lot of movies out there of that situation exactly taking place. So yeah, I think um, we can all sort of find ways to relate to that situation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to sort of acknowledge the fact that there are those, as you call it, parachute um, siblings who sort of think that they, they can come in and have some sort of assessment as to what's going on when they haven't been there the entire time and seen exactly what's going on. And there's a huge... And that can divulge into a huge can of worms as to like, okay, well, you're not here. I'm here all the time kind of situation. And that can cause a further strain on the sibling relationship that goes on as well. Right, right. You can see the, the potential for feelings of resentment. Although at the same time, you know, we talk about those, those parachute family members sometimes the things that are most challenging for us to hear are those things that have a little bit of truth at them. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for caregivers too to think about, am I seeing the situation clearly? Is there something to this? Um, so for example, is it, is it hard to come to terms with mom's maybe not getting the care that she needs right now, or she, I need more help as a caregiver even, um, and to get that kind of outside perspective. So it, it does go both ways in some cases. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think it's, um, it's very case by case. I think this whole topic is a case by case <laughs> situation. Exactly. And I can definitely see how now these questions are a bit like, Okay, it depends. <laughs> it depends. That's the, the best thing you can say as a researcher. Well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're sort of going into the practice and habit brief part of the show. Um, what is a practice that you do to become a better person in terms of um, as a family? Yeah. And so I, I'm thinking about this with regards to caregiving, but I think it applies to a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. could even be your work family, I guess. Uh, and uh, pleasant activities, actually. And this is something that I do a lot of caregiver intervention work. Um, so helping family members through psychoeducation to manage some of the stresses of caregiving. And this is um, a component that's in several evidence-based caregiver interventions. And it's what's involved is when we say pleasant activities, we're really talking about self-care and we encourage family members to do things that they want to do. So when we think of self-care, we have those things that we have to do, we have to take, take a shower in the morning, we have to go to bed and get good sleep hygiene and eat healthy, but want to do activities. These pleasurable activities are really, really important. So these are things that um, could feel, you know, quote unquote pointless. Some some caregivers sometimes feel like it's indulgent. Um, and I want to say, no, these are critical things to spend your time on. Um, it could be going to a Zumba class. It could be painting, reading, um, whatever it, it is that brings you joy. I think that is an amazing way to define it because I've had a lot of people come on the show and say self-care is the best way to do it. But pleasanting act pleasantry activities, I think is such a better way to say it because you do all the bed minimum you already do the stuff that you need to do like take a shower take a bath relax put it do a face mask those are things that you do need to do but the want to do like okay i want to go to to the indoor playground and act like a little kid for a few hours like that's something that you need to do that you want to do not something that you need and i think that is such a better way of describing it other than just saying self-care is is such a nicer way of saying it 
Well, and I think too, it's it's giving yourself permission. Um, I just did a, a talk in November with one of my colleagues, and there was this caregiver, and she said, you know, I I have this. What was it? She was talking about. Um, she felt guilty because she spent all her morning, you know, going on Facebook and playing games and all of that on her tablet or phone. She said, I feel so guilty. I feel like I get nothing done. And I'm, and we were going, no, 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 no. That is your pleasurable activity. That is something that is bringing you joy. You know, you maybe if it, it lasts all, all day, but if you're sitting down and saying, I'm going to spend this amount of time, you know, playing games on my phone because that really brings you joy go for it. Um, there's no wrong way to, to, to go about this. I, I think like, I love that so many people, like they talk about the stuff that the indulgence that this is such a wrong thing to do, like spending that little time to yourself, but there's like scrolling through your social media for a, like an hour or so. Like that's something that your mind and your body is basically telling you that you need to do, that you need to sort of take a load off for a little bit. And as long as you're being intentional about it, you're saying, you know, I really just want to catch up on Twitter or Instagram or whatever your chosen social media is, and that brings you joy, go for it. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you faced when you do the practice of doing a pleasurable activity? I'm so sorry. I, could you repeat the question you cut out for just a oh, second? Oh, that's okay. Um, I'm just saying, what are some of the challenges that you face when you're going through a pleasurable activity? Ah, so one is, you know, getting over the guilt and saying, I'm going to do this. And the other piece, especially for caregivers, is um, planning it and doing it. And there's some real, real challenges when you're caring for somebody, especially if they're they're heavily reliant on you, you as a caregiver. And so it can be challenging to um, schedule time when you can do that activity. So if you need to do to bring in somebody else to provide respite care, so somebody else to help um, take a load off so you can get go do your activity. And that can, in some cases, require scheduling and planning. Sometimes it, it could be, again, that cost factor if you're using formal care services. Um, and so I think it's easy to, to put that off because it's so much work to even plan. Um, that's why we, we really encourage caregivers to plan ahead, um, strategize how you're going to do this so it doesn't keep getting pushed off. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a really nice, like a really big challenge, especially that also, I mean, the guilt for one. And then the second is the planning part, because you're also having to let your um, care recipient know that, okay, I'm going to be gone for this amount of time. And if they put a lot of trust in you, it's going to be hard to sort of them to be comfortable with other people as well. You also have to find the person they feel comfortable with to take over and that just seems like more work than it's worth well and i think it's the other component of this and i have to give um mad props to family caregivers because caregivers are some of the most creative and resourceful people out there um they find ways to get things done and so it sometimes it can require some creativity on the caregiver's part to say okay this is what I was thinking about for my pleasurable activity. This might not be possible today, but is there something that I can do with my care recipient? Because it's maybe it's not a good day to leave them alone, um, that we can do a pleasurable activity together. Should we go take a walk together, take a drive together on a scenic route, um, watch a movie together, listen to some music that we both like? So that might also um, be an option for some family members too. That sounds like a great alternative, to be honest. Um, so how do you think that this practice impacts your personality and also your perception in life? Yeah, so there actually has been some um, pretty good, good research out there about um, interventions which include this pleasurable activity component. And we find that caregivers tend to be um, better at controlling upsetting thoughts, that they have lower symptomology of depression uh, when they're able to participate in these interventions that include pleasurable activities. And of course, you know, there's more research that needs to be done. Um, but, you know, my personal opinion about what, what could be happening here, and this is probably anecdotal from my own experience. Um, we all have stressors that we handle in life. And so I use this practice on my own too. 
is I think it's helpful to gain perspective. So when you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, sometimes you might not have the perspective that you need on a situation. I think taking a step back and engaging in something that you enjoy provides an opportunity for you to you know, reapproach the situation that you're finding challenging with a new perspective, and you might be able to see things more positively, or it might be a little, little um, less overwhelming, or maybe you can think about it in a way that um, helps you to resolve whatever that challenge may be. So, those are that's kind of my own own opinion too. No, I think that's that's a great that's a great opinion. Um, so, based on your experience and your um, following through with this pleasurable activity. But do you have any other recommendations of a practice that you can combine to improve or enhance this particular practice? I would say, and we touched on this a little bit, you know, of course, we talked about doing those activities with your with your family member um, when you can't get away. At the same time, I do think it's important for caregivers to have a break from caregiving, so to get respite care. And so respite care can mean having another family member come in to provide assistance. It can mean uh, using adult day services. It can mean having a home care assistant. It can look like a lot of different things. But there is some research that um, is being done that shows that actually um, receiving respite can uh, help to regulate levels of the, the cortisol hormone, that stress hormone in family caregivers. Um, this work was done with adult day services. So we think that caregivers when they're anticipating that they're going to get a break in the morning, um, they, sh they show a more regula regulated pattern of cortisol um, that could suggest that they're experiencing less stress um, compared to days when they don't have that, that availability of respite care. So I think, you know, pleasurable activities are good in any context, but if you can get a break from caregiving um, and find an opportunity to do so, that can be really important too. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really... Um really good thing to acknowledge as well. I think that's a bigger, I think that's, that's a longer term, isn't it, than just taking a day off. I think it's probably like a, a week or something that you can take off. It, it could. I mean, that's the great thing about respite. It can look different depending on the different caregivers. So for some caregivers, they'll get respite care. Go away on a weekend. Go take a vacation. Um, other caregivers are saying, I just need my Friday afternoon. If I can get three or four hours of respite care and I can go do what I need to do and what I want to do, that's what respite care is important for, for them. So it's going to depend on the on the individual too. Well, that, that sounds that sounds really nice. It sounds like a nice it, it sounds like a system that does work. So <laughs> if we can get support, so I will say that's one again, if I can have my policy policy wish list, we could increase respite care um, supports for family members. That would be top on there. Okay, that's that's number one on the list for all countries then. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're doing a little bit of a questions from audiences now. And this one question, I was going to put it in during the main questions, but I think it's, we needed some questions here. I already added a few from the interview. So my care recipient is very um, used to being independent and used to sort of having their... Um, their own independence when it comes to dealing with day-to-day -day things. How do I let them know that things do need to change in terms of their frustration of not being able to do it themselves? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a really good question. And it's a great question, but also a very challenging situation. And I think that's a perfect scenario to talk about in terms of relationship because this balance of safety and independence is is one source of conflict and strain that we do see between care partners, the caregiver and the care recipient, where, um, and I, I, I have this expression that I learned from my doctoral advisor, Kate Wilbur, and it's, you know, we want um, safety for the people that we love, but we want independence and freedom for ourselves. And so first, I think there, there has to be an acknowledgement of um, recognizing that would you want the same thing for yourself in a given situation now i think w when you're talking about caregiving especially when you're caring for somebody with a cognitive impairment who might not be able to accurately assess a level of risk it becomes a little bit more complicated because you have to 
negotiate with them, but also you're responsible in some ways as a caregiver. You're also kind of a, a protector in those cases um, to make those decisions. So it might be that, and this is kind of the classic situation we see, I have to take away the keys. And that's not the ideal situation. It would be better if you could work out a transportation plan or persuade your loved one that that it's no longer safe for them to drive, which is is, is an activity that represents independence in a lot of in a lot of societies. Um, but sometimes that's not always feasible. Now, I, I will say that oftentimes there is a way to um, get between a you know total support versus a total freedom and total independence um, perspective, where there might be ways to modify an activity that makes it so that the person can participate as independently as possible without totally, you know, without totally affecting their safety. Although a caregiver might have to affect, you know, accept a certain level of risk. Um, so this can be things like um, decisions about what to eat. So, you know, maybe you're, you don't want your family member eating ice cream every morning if they're experiencing diabetes, um, and that could, could have a serious health risk on them. But could you work with this person to occasionally allow them to have a treat um, in that kind of way, if you understand what I mean? Yes, no. I think, I think it's also the trying not to treat them like kids as well, I think is a really big, big thing because you're used to telling kids, okay, you're not supposed to have any of these things but you telling your own either parent or your person you're looking after that you're not able to you're not supposed to have this they're an adult they can still kind of do what they they want and they spend years doing what they want and getting them letting them know that these situations aren't can't happen as frequent as you want it to happen is something that I think would definitely take a lot more uh, persuading in a way well, and I think that goes back to why why we do have this challenge where this this expression, oh, I'm it's like I'm the parent now. It doesn't always work in the in these situations for that exact reason. I actually had um there was I won't reveal who who it was, but um there was an individual who I, I really admire and she was caring for her her husband as he was um living with a terminal diagnosis and she was so frustrated at times she shared with us that she yelled at him on, on occasion. And, you know, of course, as a gerontologist, I'm thinking, okay, a potential elder mistreatment, but actually this was somebody who didn't have a cognitive impairment. And he, you know, this, this was a spousal partner and uh, presuming most partners occasionally get in arguments or get on each other's nerves. And this is a normal part of a relationship. Nobody's perfect. But he said to her, I am so glad that you'll still snap at me because I'm so sick of people treating me with the kid gloves. And it's it's almost um, a, a way that she showed her continued respect for him. It's so interesting how they how they see it. They see it as like they're not being tiptoed around. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so it's so hard to find the balance as well, because you're not you're also wanting to treat them with respect, but you also end up treating them with as a child and you don't want they don't want either they don't want to be looked at as seen as something that they need taking care of and this is where that issue of cognitive capacities the ability to assess risks and make decisions so if you're caring for somebody living with dementia and dementia of course is not you know a, a monolith it's um you can be caring for somebody who's in the early stages of dementia who are who who is able to make um, you know, more decisions than somebody in later stage. Although for the most part, even when you're caring for somebody living with dementia, that person is going to be able to make at least some decisions. Like usually, you know, the idea of what sweater are you going to wear or what breakfast cereal would you like aren't going to have that huge level of risk. So they should be able to make that choice even if they have a cognitive impairment. Um, and then when you're caring for somebody who doesn't have that cognitive impairment, and that just as you say that this is an adult and they've, they've made these decisions all their life, should they really be, um, should you be able to say no? Of course, people, and this is where I, I apologize, I should cut myself off before I go down the rabbit hole. Um, but I think, I, you know, internally I could see caregivers might have uh, an inner conflict going, do I want to be enabling this behavior while I'm caring for this person? But that's, again, that role renegotiation. Yeah, no, 100%. I 
it's it's such a difficult thing to be able to balance and to be able to say that okay no I'm taking care of you this is how it's gonna go um so the next question is kind of looking into telling their children that another family member is going to be joining them so it's sort of like how do I tell my kids that they have to share a room to make space for their grandfather that's joining them yeah that's a really good one um so it's interesting because again contest text specific um do the and presume I'm assuming in this case this might be like a grandparent parent moving in with the grandkids and we see a lot more of these multi generational households um, and you know in some ways I think it can be helpful to explain to the um, grandkid or the the child that um, this is a, an opportunity for you to get to know your grandparent more or um, this is what we do in this family. This is a value that we have, that we take care of each other. I want you to participate in this and uh, kind of the parent can model why this is important as they, um, as they provide care and as this situation changes. Um, of course, it is probably important to recognizing that reality. A kid who has to move out of their own bedroom is probably going to be upset, but trying to, to help them understand that we make sacrifices uh, for family um, and kind of seeing the positive side so could be helpful. Th this is actually an area I haven't seen too, too much on. So I apologize if I'm stumbling through a bit. <laughs> no, no. I, it's the first thing that I've, I never thought when I saw that question, I never thought that that would be an issue. Like just imagining how to tell kids that life is pretty much going to change a little bit and things are going to be a bit more different, especially if they're younger as well. I think it's a little bit more difficult. Um, well, or or potentially they, a younger child may be more ready to adapt. So we talked earlier about these intergenerational differences. So if you have a much older family member living um, with a much younger family, and there might also be, I don't know where the where the older family member is moving from, are they coming from the same country or they live, were they living in the same cultural context? You might have um, differences in terms of culture and expectations. What should we call grandma? How do we interact with her or, um, or grandfather? How do we talk to this person that um, could, could be challenging at times? Yeah, no, I think that that's a, such a good way of looking at it as well. Just trying to see if they're from a another culture if they are from another culture then it's a whole other aspect that probably the kids aren't exposed to as well is another is another thing so trying to get them used to the way the um both generations communicate is yeah. going to be an interesting one for sure all right so the last few minutes we love to give the guests a chance as a open mic just sort of talk about what they're interested in or what they're working on they don't have to be work related it can be what you're personally um looking into and what your interests are um so yeah i'd love to give you the floor <laughs> oh my, well i feel like i've gotten to talk about um really a, a lot about what i've been, what i've been passionate about so um as an assistant professor my uh my work at um Fortunately and unfortunately, in ways, it is is my life. I probably, if you ask my partner, should have more boundaries. But this is, I just love love this stuff. And um, as we were talking before, this is being able to research and work with caregivers is just such a blessing. Since it's it's something where if you go up to anybody on the street, um, they can tell, they recognize, they know what you're researching. They have a story about caregiving, whether it's something they were providing care or they're parent was providing care or their friend is providing care. Um, one of our former first ladies, Rosalind Carter, said that there are four types of people in the world, people who um, are caregivers, who, people who will become caregivers, people who will need caregivers. And oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing on a recording. There's a fourth type of person, but everybody is going to be a caregiver at one point or need a caregiver, all that to say. Um, and I guess, okay, so this is, this is I'll go back to the policy piece um, too, because we're seeing, I think, during our conversation, how the personal, the personal side of caregiving, and caregiving is a very personal matter, interacts so much with our social and policy systems. Um, something I think that 
is of interest to me is how do we persuade policymakers, um, but also recognize amongst ourselves as, as families, as we come into a caregiving role or begin to recognize ourselves as caregivers, because sometimes caregivers don't use that term. Caregiver can be kind of clinical sounding. Um, and realize that it's okay for us to make policy demands um, that caregiving is no longer or should probably never really was a private family matter. It's something that has an effect on our employment, our financial well-being. Um, it's just so pervasive in how it affects a person's life. And I think that... Um, we're, we need to have policymakers who recognize that um, we can't keep kicking the can down the road. We have this huge aging population and more and more family members who are providing care to loved ones living with chronic and disabling conditions in old age. Our systems have to change to adapt to our new societal needs. That's my soapbox. <laughs> no, I think that's a, it's such a, it's especially the way the world is changing. Like if everything, people are getting older, people are also more, um, people are more outspoken as to what they're needing and to what they're demanding, I think. And just having that, I think the whole system needs to be reevaluated because I, I don't think that it's really taken into account just how much is expected of people and just having that, um, I think just have, finding a space where you're able to talk. Like, I mean, this podcast could go out and it could definitely spread a word on how a policy needs to be better, but also just having that direct conversation with people. And I know a lot of shows are starting to do that where they're bringing in politicians um, to talk about it a bit more and to talk about why it's important it's just having that conversation and making it a bit more um, accessible for everyday people to sort of say, this is what I'm dealing with. How can the system help me? Right. And I think even as simple as, um, you know, when you're talking to other family members and your friends and helping them recognize, hey, I think you're a caregiver. Did you know in their in your community, there may be supports available to caregiving to to caregivers, um, so that people know that there may be resources available to them. Even if they feel like I'm not a caregiver, I'm just picking up groceries for mom, or I'm just doing this or that. No, you're a caregiver, and you should have supports to help you do this role. No, a hundred percent, and that it's so interesting. Like we can keep going for this longer and longer, <laughs> and look at deep dive into policies between Australia and America, but. Um, I think that would be that would be such a good research as to how how it differs and how it's similar and basically what one country can learn from the other or vice versa. So yeah, I think maybe eventually we can um that that will happen. <laughs> I would love to actually that's one some one of the something I would had a chance to do um in the United Kingdom. Actually the UK and particularly Scotland um, we're, we're quite a bit or are quite a bit um, further along in terms of caregiver supports and making sure caregivers have a right to an assessment, although um, whether or not a policy is executed, so it can be on the books, but isn't really happening in person. So I think um, I see some leadership there. I'm seeing within the U.S. Um, different states are taking leading roles, California, Washington. So I think there's a lot that um, different different societies can learn from one another to do this better and better take care of each other yeah for sure and hopefully it will happen one day very soon well while we're all getting older <laughs> we're all aging and hopefully it's a little bit better when we're facing it um so i want to thank you so much kylie for coming on and for taking time out of your sunday and joining me and talking about this topic it's definitely giving me a lot and i'm definitely going to look at that podcast that you suggested because I really want to hear more about it. It can definitely be on, in tune with a lot of my crime podcasts. So um, it can fit really well. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much. It's been a, been a pleasure and I can't wait to listen to for future episodes. Yes, for sure. Um, if any of the audience wants to get in touch with you, is there a way that they are able to? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, probably the easiest way is I have a faculty page at Case uh, Western Reserve University where I'm a faculty member at the uh, Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. You can find my email and um, telephone number and all of that on there. And you are more than welcome to email me. Okay, sounds good. So I'll, I'll put your link down below towards it. So then you can just, they can just have a direct access to it. So um, thank you everyone for listening today and hope you go and subscribe if you want to hear more about the different episodes that we have coming up for the new year. And just have a look at the different other podcast shows that we have that's on, um, that's on for show in so many different areas from personal productivity to house organization and all those things. So thank you everyone for joining me today and I hope you have a very good day. You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights podcast produced by Family Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent, and thanks for tuning in.